All right, so thank you for coming, everybody. This is an amazing turnout, and wow, that the added executive team has done an incredible job. And where did Deb go? Where did Deb go? Is she out somewhere? She's amazing. She's a rock star. I just want to do a big shout out to Deb Prince because she's the reason I'm here, and she has pulled this together in a miraculous kind of way. So, as I get started, quick question. How many people in the room feel like you really know something about radically open DBT? <coughs> oh, I love this. And if you've heard me talk before, you'll hear me say, say what I always say, which is you guys are going to think I'm so brilliant. And this is why it's so fabulous. Because this is brand new treatment. It is really innovative. It is amazing. Um, and I can't tell you enough about how excited I am about this treatment. All right, so let's get into it. Radically Open DBT is a treatment approach rooted in the neuroscience of emotional expression and social connectedness that has shown strong promise for the treatment of anorexia nervosa, refractory depression, and treatment-resistant anxiety. And I'll explain all the neuroscience stuff in a little bit. So, RODBT is transdiagnostic. What does that mean? And I'm literally asking you, I keep the audience awake by keeping you interactive. So what does transdiagnostic mean? Come on, you guys know this. Sorry, I'm UC, I'm under control, so when I see people I'm excited to see, I shout it out. So transdiagnostic means it crosses diagnoses. Meaning, radically open DBT was not developed to treat a diagnosis. It was actually developed to treat what underlies many diagnoses. So that's what transdiagnostic means, and you'll hear about this as we go along today. So RO is based in standard DBT, and read the next line. Core skills, strategies, and philosophy differ. In other words, RO is rooted in DBT, and almost nothing about it is the same as DBT. The only things that are similar are that we use diary cards, but what we track is dramatically different. We use behavior chains and solution analysis, but of course those are different because the targets are different. <coughs> and we use dialectics, gee I hope so, because it is in the title. So, really quickly, if you don't know what dialectics is, this is my brief kind of curbside explanation. There are three main philosophies of truth. There is absolutism, which says truth is absolute. You are either right or you are wrong, and there is nothing in between. Then there is relativism, and relativism says truth is relative. It's in the eye of the beholder. Everybody has their own truth, so we really don't need to bother looking for it. And then the third is dialectics. And dialectics says there is truth in all viewpoints, but not all viewpoints are all true. So it is our job, when we are using dialectics, to seek out the truth in any viewpoint even if it is in direct opposition to our own. Really fun exercise in dialectics. If you're involved in politics at all, try to validate something on the other side. It's so much fun. All right, so central issue of over-control is loneliness, not emotion dysregulation. So when people are more over-controlled, and you'll hear me speaking forward about OC, which stands for over control, and UC, which stands for under control. So when people are more under controlled, they tend to struggle with dysregulation. And they need to learn to regulate. They need to learn to calm down. They need to learn to try harder, do more, work more. When people are more over controlled, in fact, they do all that pretty darn well. And so what they need to learn is how to chill out, how to relax, and how to connect with people. So I'll go into that a lot more today. 
Over-controlled clients are more likely to benefit from being taught to actively seek well-being. I was actually, and I know people have said when I say this that they get jealous, that's not why I'm saying it. I was in France a few weeks ago, and I was with Tom Lynch and the senior clinician team because Tom lives in France. And so we were there like doing intensive RODBT stuff. And while I was there, I had a patient who emailed me. And she said, I hope you're learning a lot of good stuff to fix me. <laughs> and I wrote back, isn't that fascinating? Because RO is not about fixing problems. RO is about seeking well-being. Because when people are more over-controlled, their comfort zone is identifying a problem and fixing it. And identifying a problem and fixing it. And identifying a problem and fixing it. And that's actually not to their benefit. What is going to be much more beneficial is seeking well-being. What do you want more in your life? And how can we help you get it? The goal is to welcome our OC clients back into the tribe. Tom Lynch refers to ROTT clinicians as tribal ambassadors. So most of us know that human beings are tribal by nature. What does that mean? It means, like back in caveman days, if we didn't have a tribe, what would happen to us? Die. We'd die. We'd die. We'd die from exposure. As I like to joke, we'd be saber-toothed tiger meat. I actually don't know if saber-toothed tigers were back then, but yeah, we would die, right? So in this day and age, what happens to us if we don't have a tribe? We don't die, right? There are lots of people who do not have connections. You get depressed and you're lonely. Ding, 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 you win the prize. You get depressed and you get lonely, right? Lonely, depressed, anxious. This is what happens when we don't have a tribe, and this is what RODDT is kind of rooted on. So I'm going to talk about the biosocial theory. This is kind of an outline slide. I'm going to talk about nature, which is biotemperamental and genetic. So first, I just want to stop for a second and say, what is biotemperament? Biotemperament is this in a nutshell. It is the biological basis of emotion that impacts two things, how we perceive the world and how we regulate emotion. And those things are in us from the time we are born. Okay, so this is the biotemperament. Now, what does it mean? So if all of a sudden we heard lots of loud noise outside, and we all ran to the window, and there were lots and lots of people gathering, some of us in the room would go, ooh, is that a parade? And we'd move towards it. Others of us in the room would go, whoa, that's a mob. And they would move away from it. Same exact stimuli. Very different biotemperamental reactions to those stimuli. And then how we regulate emotion as well also is part of that biotemperament. Then I'm going to talk about nurture. Nurture is family, culture, and environment. And I want to highlight culture, and I do have a slide on this. Culture has a huge impact on this. There are over-controlled and under-controlled people in every culture, but how they look can be very different because of the powerful cultural influences. And then I'm going to talk about coping, which is excessive self-control under distress. It is low openness and deficits in pro-social signaling. So it was funny, you know, right before we got started, hi Mary Carol, right before we got started, <laughs> when people eyebrow wag me, I gotta say hello. And you'll learn about that when I go along. So, um, when we first got started this morning, I can't remember who it was who commented on the lights flickering. That is a social signal. And what happened? People responded, right? So social signaling, I want to just take a quick moment and briefly describe what social signaling is. Social signaling is what we communicate. It can be verbal, more likely nonverbal. It can be on our face. It can also be on our body. It can be in a light switch. So social signaling is absolutely crucial in our ability to build relationships. 
So you'll learn more about that today. So for example, if I'm having a conversation with someone, and they're talking and talking and talking, and I go like this, I'll do it for the side of the room. I'll do it over here. What am I socially signaling? I'm annoyed. I wanted to stop. Enough already. Come on. Now, I don't have to say a single word, right? But you get that social signal right away. So that's an example of social signaling. So I'm going to move into the biotemperament, the nature piece. Again, keep in mind, biotemperament shows up as early as ages four or five. So think about it. You know, think about children you know. You can kind of sense when you have a little child who is perfectionistic and shy and has all of these kinds of temperamental traits, kind of threat sensitive and things like that. So when people have BPD, they are getting blasted by threat and reward. Threat and reward. And it leads to this very chaotic presentation. I also want you to keep in mind as I'm going through this biotemperamental piece that someone can be over-controlled and have attention deficit disorder. And it makes the picture look really fuzzy. And I also want to point out someone can be under-controlled by nature. Their biotemperament is under-controlled, but if they have been traumatized, it can make them look over-controlled because the trauma makes them more threat sensitive. The trauma makes them lo lower in novelty seeking. So the trauma can make them look different, but when you deal with the trauma, they go back to being their happy you see selves. So you never flip sides in this theory, like permanently. You, what you are, what your biotemperament is, is what your biotemperament is. That's just it. I also want to just put a disclaimer out there. As I go through this presentation, historically my experience is that people absolutely love to self-identify. <laughs> and so people often will be like, well, that's me. Oh my god, that's me. That's so me. Oh, well, that's not me. So that doesn't really make sense. So I want to make it clear, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> What I'm talking about is tail ends of the bell curve, okay? Most of us are in that flexible range in the middle. And we can move on which side we are, but we never flip sides. So when I was in my 20s, I was so UC that you probably would never have thought I would be where I am today in my career. And over the years, as I became a mom, as I moved further in my career, I realized that if I got frustrated in a meeting, I couldn't just burst into tears. And so I needed to learn to pull on my inhibitory control, which I don't have much of, and so that I wouldn't speak out or show my emotion anytime, anywhere. So you can move on your side, but you don't flip. Now I'm going to talk about reward sensitivity. I already kind of referenced it. People who are more under controlled have high reward sensitivity. Let me tell you, it's fun to be UC. It is fun, right? Like we get so excited and so jazzed about things. Like for example, Colleen, MC, right? I see these people that I love. Where's Jessica? Jessica! I see these people that I love and I get excited, right? Now, when someone is more over-controlled, they have a very low reward sensitivity. And what that means is, they are not easily impressed. It's kind of what it means, right? So one of the examples I always give, I have this cup my daughter brought me from U uh, sorry, U of C, sorry, no, University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. So she brought me this cup. It is the most beautiful color blue when ice water is in it. When ice water is not in it, it's opaque. So you put ice water in it, it turns this gorgeous color of blue, you drink it down, you see the opaque showing up. Then if you take a sip, the blue covers that whole place where your ice water went. And if your thumbs are warm, you can make little thumb animals. It's super fun, right? Now if you're OC, you are likely looking at me right now going, Ellen, 
<laughs> it's a cock. <laughs> like, are you serious? Okay, so that's that not easily impressed thing. Back in the day when I'd get an A, I'd be like, I got an A. I'm so awesome. <laughs> now, what does an OC say when they get an A? Yeah, why not an A plus? <laughs> of course I got an A. I'd be upset if I didn't get an A. And again, and I heard this a lot in college, Ellen, what is your problem? <laughs> okay, because I'd get so excited about things. Moving on to inhibitory control. When people are emotionally under control, and I already referenced this, we have low inhibitory control. Meaning, when your patients say, I can't fight the urge, they really mean it. Like, they have an urge, and it is very hard to fight against that urge. Again, as I've gotten older, I've moved up the curve. But I was at a conference just within the past year, standing in line behind a woman who had fringes on her jacket. <laughs> oh, my God, did I want to play with those fringes. I really did. And I was like, Ellen, keep your hands down. That is not appropriate. You don't know this person. When people are over controlled, they have high inhibitory control. And in fact, in RO, we refer to it as superior inhibitory control. Now, how do you think OCs feel about being superior? They love it. They love it. And so at ERC, we developed these skills classes for in RODBT. And we had intro to RODBT, and then we had advanced RODBT. What do you think the problem was with that? <laughs> Every OC patient wanted to be in the advanced class. They did, and the reality is we had intro to learn the basics so that you could benefit from the advanced. So we actually changed the name to RO in action. That's a little bit better. They can cool their jets a little bit to get into that group. Okay. So again, getting back to that high inhibitory control, we use this in treatment and it's fabulous. So, so like for example, I once had a patient who I was working with, she had compulsive exercise. This was a big thing for her. And she had stepped down through all levels of care. She's doing great. One day she comes into session with me and she says, Ellen, the urges to exercise are just getting out of control. And to, to be honest, I, I can't fight them anymore. I, I'm exercising more than I should. I can feel it. It's coming on board. And I went, huh. So just quickly, you're OC, right? And she said, well, yeah, you know I'm OC, that's why you're working with me. And I said, right, 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 yeah, so OCs, they have superior inhibitory control, right? And she went, yeah. And I said, okay, so if you have superior inhibitory control, I guess I find myself wondering, is it that you can't fight the urge, or is it that you don't believe you should? Now, this is a game changer. Because if I had fallen, hope, line, and sinker, which we do, and by the way, our OC patients know this, if I had fallen for, I can't fight the urge, which by the way, if you see say it, they mean it. So don't, don't make this across all patients. But if an OC says, I can't fight the urge, and I believe it, I'm going to throw a bunch of DBT skills at them, right? I'm going to give them distress tolerance. I'm going to give them emotion regulation. I'm going to help them fight the urge. And do you think they will keep exercising? Yes. yes, they will. Because they don't need those skills. They actually know how to fight urges. So by going down the path of, I don't know, I find myself wondering, is it perhaps that you don't believe you should fight the urge? And she looked at me and she went, yeah. Yep, that's it. That is a whole different conversation. So it's really fun to use this inhibitory control and treatment. Moving on, attention to detail versus low attention to detail, high, low. So the way I describe this, OCs are incredibly detail focused. And this is, again, biotemperament. This is the way their brains think. And this is really important. So an OC will see every vein on every leaf on every tree. I 
will run smack into that tree because I am looking at the beautiful forest. <laughs> I do not see the trees, like let alone the leaves, right? So the UCs have more global focused processing. This can be incredibly beneficial, for example, in relationships. So my mother is over controlled. And when my mother comes to my house, what do you think that experience is like for her? <laughs> it's not good, but let me tell you. So it used to be that she would walk into my house and she would get overwhelmed. And she'd be like, that needs fixing, that's not in the right place, this is broken, why is there such a mess over here? What is going on in this house? Now, how do you think I felt? I didn't like having my mom come over very much. Imagine that. Because I felt horrible about myself, right? And the reality is, before I understood this biotemperamental piece, my mother can't help but see all of those things. And I can't help but not see all of those things, okay? And this has so helped our relationship because she now doesn't judge me for being UC. She acknowledges it, and I don't judge her, nor do I feel judged by her because she sees all those details. So she works very hard not to tell me everything that crosses her mind about what's wrong in my house. And I try not to get really distressed when she does tell me a few things. Then we move on, oh, one more attention to detail thing. Think about Jerry Seinfeld, you guys know Jerry Seinfeld? Ever see the episodes where he dates? By the way, you think he's OC or UC? He's OC, right? So just really quickly, she's got mad hands. <laughs> or she eats her peas one at a time. Who does that? Or she's a close talker. And you could go on and on and on. And here's the thing. This is when that high detail focus gets in the way. Because he gets so focused on the man hands, or the way she eats her peas, or what a close talker she is, that he no longer can see this lovely, kind, intelligent, funny person sitting in front of him. All he sees are the man hands. All he sees are the way she eats. And that really gets in the way. I had a patient who said to me, if I'm at a presentation and there's a typo in the PowerPoint, I'm out. <laughs> if they don't care enough about their PowerPoint to fix it, why would I care enough to listen to them? <laughs> and I said to her, but I have typos in my PowerPoint sometimes. And she said, I know, but I know you're smart, so you get a pass. <laughs> so, and part of the reason I'm telling you this is it can be tricky sometimes because if an OC trusts you, they might interact with you differently. Okay. Moving on to novelty seeking. OCs like to know where they're supposed to be, when they're supposed to be there, how they're supposed to get there, and what will be expected of them once they are there. They will plan for when they're going to plan, for what they're going to plan, and they will plan that. They will have lists for their lists and a list that tells them where their lists are held. Okay. UCs, we kind of fly by the seat of our pants. And sometimes that's fun and sometimes it's terrifying. It can go either way. Okay, so when we, you know, one example I give of this is think about the opportunity to go to a restaurant. Now, you have this restaurant that you know every time you go there, you get a good meal. It is a solid good meal. You know what you will order. You enjoy it every time, right? Or, oh my gosh, this brand new, really cool restaurant just opened up. There's some great reviews, a couple uh, not so great reviews, but it's really new and cool new foods. Which restaurant are you gonna choose? Might tell you which way you live. And then moving on to distress tolerance. So if you notice, <coughs> OCs, it says high distress tolerance in parentheses. That's because we used to believe that OCs had super high distress tolerance and UCs have very low distress tolerance. Well, we know that UCs have low distress tolerance, right? Because when we are in distress, what do we do? We tell you. And we 
demand treatment. I want help. Help me now, right? Now, what does an OC do when they're in distress? Open. So in other words, if you really get to know most OCs internally, they feel just as distressed as any UC. But it is their superior inhibitory control that prevents them from expressing it. So they hold it in and they contain it. And it's still there. Over-controlled people, as I already mentioned, they are pre-planners. They like to plan everything. Actions are motivated by rules. But let me make this clear. It is their own rules, not societal rules. So an OC would steal, potentially, if they believe stealing is like sticking it to the man who sticks it to me every day. So again, they abide by rules, but they are their own rules. And when they have rules, they believe anybody with half a brain would follow their rules as well. And so we see that often. For OCs, abandonment is the solution. Now, very often when I talk about this in our programming, that abandonment is the solution, I will have people quickly raise their hand and say, wait a minute, I'm OC, I don't want to be abandoned. And I go, oh, is that what I said? Did I say OCs want to be abandoned? No, don't think so. In fact, what I said is, abandonment is their solution. So if an OC believes they must be abandoned, what do you think they do? Peace out. Nobody leaves me, I leave first. And this leads to OCs losing a lot of relationships that they could have maintained but they left because they were afraid they were going to be left. When OCs are uncomfortable, they leave. So, in the first session in RODBT, we address this. We say, at some point in treatment, you are likely to have the desire to leave treatment. And I am asking, will you commit to me to coming back for one more session if you have that urge or desire. And then if the OC says, oh, it's not going to happen, don't worry about it, say, I so appreciate that, that's fabulous, and I'm still asking, will you commit, if it does flukishly happen, will you commit to coming back for one more session? And if they say, sure, yeah, you don't stop there, because sure, yeah, in their minds, they could be saying sure, yeah, to anything. So you say, so you're saying sure, yeah. Are you saying yes, you will commit? Can you just tell me I will commit? If they say I will commit to coming in for one more session, there's about a 95% chance they will. Whereas UCs, commitment actually doesn't work, we know now. Because UCs will commit to anything and mean it at the time, and later, not mean it. <laughs> so for UCs, they're less likely to follow through with those kinds of commitments. For OCs, positive mood is linked to sense of accomplishment and resisting temptation. Whereas for UCs, positive mood is linked to feeling understood. So I mentioned they will show emotion with trusted friends and family. Extremely rarely in public. And when it is in public, it is due to issues of moral certitude, which is I, I'm going to teach you a lesson. That's moral certitude. So the example we give, an OC who's been containing and containing and containing, they're on a bus one day, and they have a rule, like OCs do, that if an elderly person gets on a bus, anybody under the age of 30 should give up their seat. And anyone who has half a brain should know that rule and abide by it. So this person's been containing and containing, and the bus stops, and an elderly person gets on a bus. And a teenager does not give up their seat. Watch out. <laughs> that OC will go over to that teenager and say, did you not see this elderly gentleman get on the bus? 
Don't you know when an elderly person gets on the bus, you give up your seat? What is wrong with you? Were you raised in a barn? That's an example of emotional leakage, public emotional leakage due to moral certitude. Emotional leakage almost never happens for their own personal reasons. Advantages of over-control, and there are a lot. I often will ask people, who do you think we need more on this planet, OCs or UCs? We need us all, right? I mean, that's the reality. There is a benefit to both. And on the tail ends, both can be problematic. So advantages, high social obligation. OCs will do the right thing. If you are a mean, nasty old grandparent, would you rather have an OC as a grandchild or a UC as a grandchild? Why? Why an OC? Because they'll visit you. Because it's the right thing to do. Whereas a UC might intend to visit their mean grandparent, and they wake up in the morning and they just don't feel like it. So it's not going to happen. An OC will do it because it's the right thing. OCs are organized. They fulfill duty. They are self-sacrificing. They are prepared. They value rules and fairness. They delay gratification. Have you ever seen the Stanford Marshmallow Experiment? Right? They give the kid a marshmallow, say, I'll be back in five minutes. If you, eat that, if you don't eat that marshmallow, you'll get another one. You can see that bio-temperament in action. The experimenter leaves the room. The UC kids, what do they do? Immediately, it is gone. <laughs> you see an OC kid in the room? The marshmallow. They push it, and they push it, and they push it. Oh my God! I can't look at it. But they do not eat that marshmallow. OCs try hard to get things right, and they contribute to the societal good. So if you're stuck on a bus in the middle of nowhere, would you rather have OCs on the bus or UCs on the bus? Well, it's kind of a trick question because you want a UC because we'll lighten the mood and kind of bring some humor into it. But OCs, because they are likely to have food and water. <laughs> and they will ration it. <laughs> and they will give you their portion before taking it for themselves. Okay? They're prepared. They're ready. They can handle anything. Think about it like um, hoarding. You think that's over-controlled or under-controlled? See, people think it's under control because it looks so messy. Hoarding is absolutely over control, out of control. Because if you ask a hoarder, where is that Q-tip that you used in 1993? They will tell you where that Q-tip is. But they save it because they might need it again. Right? That's that preparation thing. So, how the environment teaches over control. So this is the nurture piece. By punishing being imprecise or making a mistake, by punishing self-initiated playful behavior, by punishing displays of emotion, by punishing requests for nurturance, by rewarding appearing perfect, by rewarding detailed focus, by rewarding following rules, and by rewarding tolerance of pain. And again, I want you to keep in mind Nurture refers to family, friends, culture. So here is a bell curve that has OC on one side, UC on the other side. Greece, then more kind of like uh, maybe the United States, we're kind of somewhere in the middle, and then Japan. So here's the thing. Someone who is under controlled in Japan is likely to look like someone who is over controlled in Greece. The bell curve still exists. The biotemperamental differences are still there. But the cultural influence is so powerful that it shifts the bell curve and makes it look different. 
So when I first learned about RODBT, as you can imagine, my reward system was highly activated and I was jazzed. And I was out to dinner once with some friends, and I was like, bah, 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 bah. oh my god, oh see if you see, this is so fabulous. <laughs> and my friend Karen from Austria looked at me and she said, Ellen, there is no one like you in Austria. <laughs> and I went, ah, what does that mean? <laughs> So I quickly got on the you know, email with Tom Lynch, and he explained that, yes, there are UCs in Austria, but they're more controlled and contained than I am because the culture insists on it. Biosocial theory, so with coping. So we have the biotemperament, low, sorry, low reward sensitivity, high threat sensitivity, high inhibitory control, and high attention to detail. This Combined with the nurturing, which is mistakes are intolerable, never appear vulnerable, structure and control are essential, and winning is imperative. This leads to masked inner feelings, avoiding risk, disliking being the center of attention, and aloof and distant in their style of relating. So, quick example. Little boy named Johnny. Johnny is about six years old. Johnny has the temperament of someone over control. And Johnny is invited to a birthday party. Do you think Johnny wants to go? No, he does not. High threat sensitivity, low reward sensitivity. Johnny does not want to go to that party. Now Johnny's mom knows, and she's flexibly controlled like most of us, and Johnny's mom loves Johnny. And she knows that Johnny needs friends. She knows this. So she's like, okay, honey, here's this. How about I take you to the party, I'll be in the background, you will have no idea that I'm there, and if you need me, I'll be there. If anything happens, you know, I'll be right there for you. So off they go to the party. What do you think happens at the party? Huh? So people often say, he stays by his mom, some people say he actually has fun. Could be. But here's the thing. What do you think Johnny's, and then sometimes I hear people say, well, he learns that you know parties are dangerous. Johnny knew that before, actually. <laughs> so, so what do you think Johnny's friends think about Johnny's mom being there? Johnny the baby. Johnny, why don't you go suck your thumb, Johnny? You need your mommy with you? So what does Johnny learn? Johnny learns, I can't let my mother see my anxiety. Johnny learns, if my mom knows that I'm in distress, she's going to try to fix it, and she's going to ruin it. Let me make it clear, mom did nothing wrong. And I do want to make this clear. It is the influence of the environment, right? And so Johnny learns, to mask his inner feelings, and he learns to not be vulnerable with his mom. So, some characters we all know and love, right? Who's OC and who's UC? <laughs> so, I mean, the Sheldon one, Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory, that's pretty obvious, and it says, you know, change is never fine, so that's kind of a clue. <laughs> yes, Sheldon is OC. How about Charlie Sheen? <laughs> I assume by the laughter, you know he's UC. How about Claire Dumphy? See, I thought that was a trick one, but people tend to get it. Because she does emote a lot, but her, emote, her emoting is definitely leakage. And she is absolutely OC. I know Erica Kane is dating myself. I used to love Erica Kane. She was a soap opera star. Um, OC or UC? Actually, she's UC. She shows a lot of emotion a lot of times. She gets really worked up often. Temperance Brennan from Bones, about as OC as they come. And then Amy Schumer, got it. Totally UC. Over control do not need to learn how to be more serious. They do not need to learn how to work more or try harder. 
what do they need to learn? And by the way, I also want to put out there, yes, the RODBT manual is only, has only been out for a year and a half, but Tom Lynch and his group has been doing developmental research for over 20 years. So RODBT is actually highly researched and there is a lot out there. So if you want to check out any of the research, all you have to do is check out his website. It is radically open, all one word, dot net. That has all the trainings in RODBT. If you're jazzed about this, you have to check out that website, radicallyopen.net. All right, so what do they need to learn? They need to literally and figuratively chill out. <laughs> they need to tease and be teased. Teasing is a huge social norm. Teasing is something we do with the people we love to give feedback in a kind way. And that is both giving the tease as well as being able to receive a tease. OCs sometimes take themselves very seriously. And it doesn't always work to their benefit. They need to learn to be silly and playful. They need to learn to be vulnerable. Because vulnerability is a huge social signal. Think about this. If, and the way I describe it to patients is, they don't do these things, why? It's self-protective, right? They have their defenses up. They're protecting themselves. What's the problem with protecting yourself like that? You actually imprison yourself with those walls of protection. That's kind of what happens. So when someone is vulnerable, what are they signaling? If I tell you a deep, dark secret, if I share with you my insecurities, did you say something? Yeah. Oh, oh. no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought I heard something over there. What are, they, what are we signaling when we're vulnerable? Did I hear weakness? <laughs> that person's OC. Can I tell you? I don't know where it came from, but it's not weakness. Trust. It's trust. Being vulnerable signals, I trust you with this information. Now, if someone is never vulnerable and always presents themselves as having it together, knowing the right answer, never making a mistake, what are they signaling? I don't trust you, right? So how much do we like people who don't trust us? We don't. So here's a quick example. We have all been part of a group project, right? At some point in our lives, we have been part of a group project. So have you ever been part of a group project where one person decides, I'm going to take control, and I'm going to get the A for everybody? And it could be you. <laughs> now, by the way, did you see what I just did? I winked. Actually, the person I was winking at turned away just when I winked, so they didn't catch it. But what's, what, what would a wink be? Teasing us. That's a tease. That is a therapeutic tease. The wink would be, I see you. I know you. And I'm here for you. That's what that tease is. And it could be you, right? So getting back to this practice. So group project, they decided they're going to take control. At the end of the project, they get an A. Yay, they get an A. By the way, I love those people. Because I was like, sure, you do the work. <laughs> okay. Totally cool with that. <laughs> you see the details better than I do anyway, so we're good. And when they all go out to celebrate, do they invite the person who got them the A? Often not. And how do you think that person feels when they find out they went out to celebrate? Hurt. Angry. How dare they? I worked my butt off for them. I got them all A's. You know what? They're a bunch of idiots anyway. I don't need them. Forget it. I don't care. Right? Now, why do you think they weren't invited? So think about these social signals. When they say, just give me what you have, I'll fix it. 
We don't like them, and we don't invite them out to celebrate. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Every time I give this example in our residential programs, I have at least two people in the room going, oh my god, this makes so much sense. <laughs> And I can tell you, you know, when it comes to all of this stuff, it really does make a lot of sense. Okay? Because these signals, do you think that person intended to signal those things? No. No. But it is, in fact, what they signal. And that often is what people will say in the beginning, was like, well, that's not what I meant. I get it. It might not be. And it's still what got communicated. That's what's important to keep in mind. Neurobiology of emotional over control. We have heightened biotemperamental threat sensitivity, which makes it difficult for an individual with over control to enter their neurobiologically based social safety system. And yes, I will explain what that means. <laughs> Feeling safe activates the ventral vagal mediated parasympathetic nervous system associated with contentment, friendliness, and social engagement. So, really quick lesson in the, you know, the, the polyvagal theory. So we all know about our ventral vagal nerve, and our ventral vagal nerve has the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems working in tandem, right? Yeah. When one is on, essentially the other is off. When our sympathetic nervous system is on, what's going on with us? Fight, fight, freeze. No, oh. sympathetic only. Activation, yeah. Activation right? It's, it's actually typically that sympathetic is the flea, fight or flee, right? And then parasympathetic, when that's on? Rest and digest, right? That's our relaxed state, right? What are we missing? Well, no, that happens with parasympathetic social engagement. So we did flight and fight, and we did safe. Freeze. Dorsal. So the dorsal vagus nerve, exactly. So, so Stephen Porges who is an autism spectrum researcher, actually about 15, 10, 15 years ago, discovered the polyvagal theory, and he recognized that we have a dorsal vagus branch. And this dorsal vagus branch is our most primitive part of our nervous system. Even frogs have it. Do you know what happens when you pick up a frog? What happens when you pick up a frog? We pee on you. Yeah, I like to say the three P's. It pees, it poops, it passes up. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't need to get a mouthful of ice when I took a sip of water. Yeah, the three P's. It pees, it poops, it passes out. That's the dorsal vagus nerve. So, what we now recognize is that dorsal vagus nerve does kick in, and I'll talk about that. In a I'll talk about that right now, actually. So. Tom Lynch developed the neuroregulatory system. We have five emotionally relevant stimuli that influence perception, each with a neurologically based response tendency. So, the first one is safety. When we are in our safety state, our parasympathetic nervous system is fully engaged, and this is on the ventral vagal complex, right? Now, when that happens, our heart rate slows, our blood pressure slows, our breathing rate slows. We want to be with people. We want to socialize. We are happy and content. Then, novelty. Novelty happens when something shifts. Something changes or there's feedback given. And novelty, our parasympathetic starts to come offline, but our sympathetic has not fully come online. And it leads to us wanting to stop and stand still and assess. We are assigning valence. Is this new thing good for me or is this new thing bad for me? We stay in novelty for the shortest amount of time. The next one is reward. And if you are very OC, you might not have much familiarity with this. Just kind of a tease. Reward is when our sympathetic excitatory approach arousal comes online. So when there's something that we find rewarding, our heart rate starts to speed up, our blood pressure goes up, our breathing rate goes up. Oh my God, we get so excited! And we get very focused on that reward. 
Now we lose our ability to be aware of the social cues because we are so reward focused. We will step on people's toes. We will knock people down to get that reward. Then we move to threat. In our threatened state, our defensive arousal, our sympathetic nervous system, defensive arousal comes online and it makes us want to move away. So remember, the reward makes us move towards, threat makes us move away. Okay? Now, in that threatened state, heart rate's up, blood pressure's up, breathing rate's up, physical and emotional pains, oh, sorry, physical and emotional pain sensitivity is up. We feel and experience everything. Now keep this in mind, because a lot of things happen when, this, when we're in that threatened state. In that threatened state, all of the muscles in our face, and we have a lot, what do you think happens to them? They tighten. And it leads to this. Do you want to hang out with me? <laughs> We'll have a lot. <laughs> Come on. Right? Okay. So keep that in mind in terms of social signaling. The muscles in our ears, in our inner ears get tight, and it impacts our ability to hear certain frequencies. And here's the kicker. It's the frequency of human voice. <laughs> so if you're wondering about that, do you remember this Laurel-Yanni debate? Did you hear Laurel or Yanni? Those were about frequencies. Right? And so I could only hear, I think it was Yanni. I think I kept hearing Yanni, 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 because I'm older. Younger people only heard Laurel, and people in the middle could hear both. Okay? That's how sensitive our ears are to frequency. When we are in a threatened state, we, our ability to hear human voice gets impaired. So it's not actually that we're so fatutzed that we can't think. It's actually that we literally can't hear as well. The muscles around our vocal cords get tight. What do you think that does? It prevents sing-songy voice. So think about how we communicate with babies. Because babies' neuroregulatory systems are not highly developed. So they count on their caregivers to help them know what state they should be in, right? So when we are interacting with babies, hi baby, hello honey buddy, I love you. Now you, by the way, could be saying, hi you little piece of poo, I can't stand you, I wish you'd just go away. And what would the baby do? Right? Because they're responding to the big facial expressions, the sing-songy voice, all of which you are safety state. Okay? So, in threatened state, we lose that ability and our voices go flat. And our faces go flat. And what do you think that signals? Danger. It signals, I don't trust you. Right? Because I'm in a threatened state. So if I'm in a threatened state around you, it's probably because I don't trust you. Now, by the way, that's not necessarily true. And people often refer to that facial expression as RBF. Anyone ever hear of that? <laughs> we don't like that. We don't like that in our ODBT. We actually call it RTF, resting threatened face. Because it's actually much more likely that the person is feeling threatened that their face is flat. Not that they're like mean or, you know, narcissistic or anything. It's literally they're in a threatened state, their face goes flat, their voice goes flat. Then we're gonna move on to overwhelmed. In the overwhelming state, we go into that state when our body perceives a life-threatening danger. Think about the things our patients do that make their bodies perceive life-threatening danger. And when our bodies perceive life-threatening danger, we go from ventral vagal complex to dorsal vagal complex which is parasympathetic, and that's important. Because in the overwhelmed state, 
our heart rate decreases, our blood pressure decreases, our breathing rate decreases, our physical and emotional pain sensitivity decreases. We are basically like zombies. We do not want to socialize. We are not content. Let's think about this. OC patients, people on the tail ends, live in a threatened state. That is where they exist. So how easy do you think it is for them to get back up to safety? Before RODDT, almost impossible. So what do you think feels better, threatened or overwhelmed? You better believe it, overwhelmed. Right? Because I'd rather be numb than feel everything. And by the way, this is why our patients freaking hate us when we refeed them. Because what are we doing? When we refeed them, we are essentially pushing them from overwhelmed back up to threatened where they are feeling everything. And they don't like it and we can have compassion for that. And they have to get back up there on their way to safety, which is what we can teach them how to do. And by the way, when we're talking about this, think about the cue states. What cues your safety state? And help your patients understand what cues theirs. So for me, the second I get home from work, I beeline up my stairs, and PJs go on this body. <laughs> PJs cue my safety state. Once PJs are on my body, I am home. I'm not leaving again. I am relaxed. I'm cuddling with my puppy, and all things are good in the world. Right? Also, when I was young, anytime I was sick or not feeling well, my parents would rub my hair. So rubbing my hair cues my safety state. So it's important for everybody to have a sense of what cues your safety states and what cues those safety states of your patients. The neuroregulatory system is bidirectional. It's kind of like if we're anxious, what do we, what do, we do with our breath? We slow our breathing down, and it actually can decrease the anxiety, right? It's a similar kind of thing. We can use our bodies to change our state, and our state can impact our bodies. And here's the kicker, one person's cue state can impact another person's cue state, okay? And if you're clinicians in the room, you've had this experience because it happens before you can actually think about it. The impact of a social signal happens in five to seven milliseconds. There is a thousand milliseconds in a second. So your body is responding to the facial expression of your patients before you're even conscious of it. We are responding to whether a person looks cold and prickly or warm and friendly before we can think about it. So if you ever walked into a room with a lot of people with flat faces, and what does that do to you? Do you ever, have you ever had this patient where it's like, okay, I'm about to see Sue. All right, I can do this. Okay, I know she's going to be looking at me like she hates me. Okay, hi, Sue. No matter what your safety state is, the second you see Sue, again, in five to seven milliseconds, your body will start responding to threat. So we have actually picked careers where we are putting ourselves in threatened states on a very consistent, regular basis. Good for us. All right. Importance of signaling. Ineffective signaling leads to isolation and loneliness. Signaling is an evolved survival skill for the tribe. It is how we communicate quickly and non-verbally. So if two tribes back in caveman days needed to collaborate to fight a big pack of animals, how could one person from one tribe approach the other tribe to signal I'm safe and I want to work with you as opposed to I want to fight you and kill you? 
by doing this. This is a very powerful social signal. What is it signaling? Openness. I trust you. You have full access to all of my organs. You could kill me in one shot. And I trust you not to do that. That is the power of social signaling. All right. Now you guys are going to get an experience because it's really early in the morning and I want you to have some fun. So I'm going to ask you to pair up. Find a pair. I'm going to be watching. And here's what you're going to do. So pay attention. For the next 30 seconds, you are going to... Scott! Hi! For the next 30 seconds, you are going to interact with your partner as though they are a long lost friend that you have just run into the airport. You have not seen them in like eight years. You love this person. Love this person. You are so excited. Go. Getting socially signaled. 
And if you want a little fun with it, look at, look at a TV show called Lie to Me. I think you can get it on Amazon. Um, it's all about social signaling, and it's super cool. Yeah. By the way, Botox really inhibits our ability. <laughs> it does. And, and it inhibits our empathy. Because when we have Botox, we cannot micro-mimic what the other person is doing. And it is through micro-mimicry that we actually fire that part of our brain. And so we feel what they're feeling. If we cannot micro-mimic, it impairs our ability to be empathic. So just keep that in mind. And it can feel creepy to our patients. <laughs> That's what RO is about. So RO helps people learn how to read social signals and how to signal in ways that pull people in. That's why social signaling is actually what we target in RO DBT treatment on the diary card. Yeah. So temperament venosi individual unintentionally brings mood states into social situations that function to isolate them from others. Bidirectionality of social signaling works against them, forming relationships. Open expression <coughs> equals trust equals social connectedness. And this is the novel mechanism of change in RODBT. You have to start having the open expression before you can signal trust. That trust then pulls people in for social connection. This is really funny. Let's see if I can figure out how to do this really quick. Thank you. Most of the things uh, I'll be talking about tonight uh, will involve how may I rise up. <laughs> it's not to say that I don't put them down from time to time, <laughs> but it is important. <laughs> are when you're talking. Um, always have your eyebrows up when you're asking someone where the toilets are. Uh, do you know the toilets are? <laughs> I was told all about this when I forgot. All right, moving on. So novel, novel mechanism of change, open expression equals trust equals social connectedness. The general idea is when people are OC, they have frozen or masked inner feelings. They get perceived as untrustworthy, stilted, or inauthentic. They get socially ostracized, which leads to feelings of depression and anxiety, and then they have more frozen, masked inner feelings. The mechanism of change, we teach open expression and self-disclosure. They get perceived as trustworthy and genuine. They are socially connected then. They feel safer and secure. They are more able to have open expression and self-disclosure. Four core deficits in RODBT, receptivity in openness. In order to learn and grow, we must be receptive to feedback. Now, most people who are over-controlled are perfectionists. Do they believe they're perfect? No. Never. What they believe is that they need to appear perfect, and they believe they need to strive for perfection but they never feel perfect. So, how do you think feedback feels to them? Criticism. Horrible. Criticism. It feels like someone is saying, nana nana boo boo, you stink at appearing perfect. And so they tend to reject that feedback, right? Which keeps people stuck. Because one of the things we know is in order for us to learn and grow as human beings, we must be open to feedback. We teach flexible responding. Is this face appropriate in a poker game? Yes. How about on a first date? <laughs> you won't have a second. Okay? So. I see my stop sign, but I have a question. We were going to, because we started late, were we going to let me go a little over or no? We had to cut. We had to. They were going to cut the break. We're not cutting. Well, They're not cutting we the break? We are having a break, but we need to. 
we need to stop. Okay, I, because we started late, I'm sorry I didn't have time to get through my slides, but we're pretty darn close. So if you have any questions or thoughts, you're welcome to come up to me whenever we do take a break.